Berkeley. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I uh, I choose a topic which is not really strongly correlated. In fact, there's there's no interaction between the between the electrons. But I think uh, it is very fundamental, and uh, I thought. Uh, Shu Chen would have uh, enjoyed it. So this is talk, I'm going to talk about the regularizability. That means the ability to put a, uh, a, uh, a low energy Hamiltonian onto a lattice as a tight bending model, whether that's possible or not. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to talk about the regularizability of symmetry protected nodal free fermion state. And of course, this is uh, in memory of uh, Sou Chen. Sou Chen, this is uh, his uh, Chinese first name. I uh, first met uh, Sou Chen while he was still a student at uh, Stony Brook. And uh, then afterwards, uh, during 1991 to 96, uh, we worked very closely. Uh, I look at my CV and I co-author nine papers with, with him, and most of them also involve uh, Steve Q. Wilson. Uh, at that time, we were interested in various aspects of quantum Hall effect. In particular, the ramification of the bosonic chern simons theory description of the quantum Hall effect. And uh, let me say, I really enjoyed uh, the collaboration and moreover, the friendship in immensely. Xu Chen is uh, one of the most uh, creative researchers I have met. And moreover, his uh, incredible communication skill, in my opinion, was uh, unmatched. And uh, he will be uh, certainly greatly missed by the physics uh, community. So uh, enough of the uh, sentimental statement, so now let me start with the science. So uh, according to the folklore, the low energy theory describing the boundary of on-site symmetry protected topological state, topological insulator, uh, example of them, cannot be put onto a lattice. Cannot, you cannot cook up a tight bending model describing the boundary of a topological state. What does on-site mean? On-site means that the symmetry transformation only mixes degree of freedom on the same lattice site. Okay. So for example, this will exclude crystal uh, transformation, which can mix degree of freedom among a different site. So I, I'm only talking about the on-site transformation. And this obstruction is relieved after you complete the boundary with the bulk degree of freedom, okay? So for example, under the time reversal symmetry and the charge conservation symmetry, time reversal required to be squared to minus one, uh, the uh, topological insulator, which live in 3D, can be perfectly realized on a 3D lattice, but however, its boundary cannot be realized uh, on a 2D lattice. There's no way to cook up a 2D tight bonding model with local hopping, short range uh, hopping, to mimic the boundary of a topological insulator. Uh, the non-regularizability, <coughs> this inability to put boundary of a topological state onto a lattice really is at heart, is extremely important for the entire physics of symmetry protected topological state. Let me explain why, okay? So here, uh, I show you a, uh, this is a two-dimensional topological state living on the surface of a torus, and uh, the, uh, the uh, red uh, curves on the boundary represent the gapless boundary state, okay? You can certainly get rid of the gapless boundary state by curving the, uh, the system and let the two boundary interact with a, with a you know, hopping, for example, completely respecting the symmetry of the original problem. So what you do is you simply sealed the uh, 
the, the deleted bond, okay? And then the system will become the bulk and the, indeed the gapless excitation is removed. Suppose you were able to uh, uh, realize the boundary uh, on, a, on a, a boundary uh, lattice. If the boundary of a SPT were realizable in the dimension of the boundary, so here the dimension boundary is 1D, then we can fabricate such a boundary here. So this is, we realize this boundary on a lattice and we bring it to the other side and we turn on this totally uh, symmetric hopping and that will kill the gapless excitation on that boundary. And if so, the gapless uh, excitation wouldn't be a symmetry protected. So this is therefore the inability to realize the boundary on a lattice is crucially uh, important to the physics of symmetry protected topological state. Okay, right. Okay, so there are many examples, well not many, uh, there are uh, examples of uh, non-regularizability theorem. For example, the most famous one is the leosin ninomia theorem, which says that an odd number of vial nodes cannot be realized on a 3D lattice, okay? And this inability to cook up a tight binding model, realize odd number of vial nodes, this is actually equivalent to the adler bell jakeev uh, anomaly. <laughs> So that means if I have a field theory which has the low energy description is one vial load, once I impose the cutoff, I can no longer uh, respect the symmetry and that induces the uh, uh, anomaly, okay? Uh, however, we know that a odd number of vial nodes can be realized on the boundary of a 4D topological uh, insulator and what's protecting this uh, 4D topological insulator is charge conservation. And in fact, we know the topological classification of that to 4D topological insulator is Z, okay? Another example, well known, for example, if we have time reversal symmetry and charge conservation symmetry, again, time reversal is required to square to minus one, then uh, a odd number of the Dirac node cannot be realized in a two-dimensional type binding model. But however, we know that a odd number of Dirac node can be realized on the boundary of a 3D time reversal and the charge conserved the topological insulator. This is the famous example, for example, of the you know, business uh, uh, synonyme. And here, we know the classification of the bulk is Z2, okay? So those are examples of the non-regularizability theorem. So my talk today is basically generalize all those theorems to any symmetry, okay? Uh, so let me see. So the purpose of this talk is to sketch a proof. I wouldn't have time to go into the detail of the proof, but let me tell you, I would uh, give you some idea of how the proof is made. So uh, I want to show that a symmetry protected nodal uh, Hamiltonian cannot be realized uh, on a lattice. So this is, uh, now I have already restrict, restrict myself to, uh, to a, um, a more narrower, uh, to a narrower uh, claim. I'm not claiming any gapless state. I'm, I'm now claiming about the nodal state. So first of all, what symmetry? Well, the symmetry I'm going to concern with is time reversal charge conservation and charge conjugation. Those symmetry, as you know, uh, define the so-called tenfold way, right? It's uh, in the classification of uh, free fermion uh, topological insulator. And by nodal, nodal Hamiltonian, I, I draw a picture here, and this uh, square is the Brillouin zone. That, by that I mean a single linear gap node. So, the gap vanish uh, linearly as the momentum approach the nodal point, um, right? And uh, I require this, uh, uh, this uh, location of the node to be at a time reversal invariant K point. A time reversal invariant K point is a point whose negative is equivalent to itself up to a reciprocal lattice vector. So K equal to zero certainly is 
time reversal invariant, but some of the k on the Brillouin zone corner or phase are also time reversal invariant. Okay, so what is the question? So uh, in order to prove this theorem, we have to set up the uh, mathematical question. So the question, so I'm going to, uh, in general, look at free fermion Hamiltonian. The most general free fermion Hamiltonian is actually expressed in Majorana basis because that allows us to uh, describe uh, Bogolyubov of uh, a quasi particle as well. So here, this chi of k is the Fourier transform of a Majorana field, and this hk is just a matrix function. Depend on how many components this Majorana field has, it's just an n by n. Uh, matrix F is a matrix function of k. So if this Hamiltonian represents a lattice, it better be that hk is a smooth matrix function of k, and it, it must obey the Brillouin zone uh, periodicity. Namely, if I add a reciprocal lattice vector to k, hk plus g better be equal to hk. Right, so now in this talk, in, 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 in fact, uh, the thing we can really prove very, very uh, firmly is when uh, this uh, Hamiltonian has the smallest the matrix uh, dimension. That means the Majorana field has the smallest uh, component. So in other words, if I give you some symmetry group and uh, I ask whether uh, this uh, uh, symmetry group can protect some uh, gapless uh, nodal state, uh, there exists a smallest uh, number of the Majorana fermion component. For example, sometimes it's four, and sometimes it's two, sometimes it's eight, and so on. And uh, you cannot accommodate the, the symmetry and also at the same time de describe the node if you insist on a uh, Hamiltonian HK smaller than that uh, dimension. So I'm, I'm going to look at the smallest uh, dimension HK and in fact, technically, from those the smallest uh, uh, dimension, you can actually stack up to construct you know, bigger dimension uh, uh, problems, and that's what we call stacking. That's where the classification comes in. Okay, so first, clearly, symmetry protection is a necessary condition for non-regularizability. Why? Because if there isn't uh, any uh, symmetry protection, then there exists a, a mass term for the nodal uh, Hamiltonian, and uh, using that mass term, you can very easily construct a uh, lattice uh, Hamiltonian satisfy the periodicity condition. For example, here, those uh, gammas uh, are the uh, Dirac matrices uh, of various dimension, and they anti-commute uh, among themselves, and they square to uh, plus one, and this uh, mass term anti-commute with all the uh, uh, gamma matrix. And this uh, form of uh, regularization I actually first read in this paper uh, Xiaoliang and uh, Xu Cheng et al. wrote in their uh, PRB paper. So here you can see that as the momentum go to zero, all the cosine are equal to one, so it is canceled here, and therefore as uh, as, uh, uh, as the a momentum uh, go to zero, the Hamiltonian acquire a nodal form. It's ki times uh, gamma i. And also with this term, you can write down the uh, dispersion uh, relation, and it's clear that the gap is non-zero everywhere except at k equal to zero. So if, there, if there's no symmetry protection, or namely a mass term exists, then you can certainly uh, write down a uh, lattice uh, Hamiltonian uh, whose energy, low energy theory is this uh, Lodo theory. Now, the important question is that, is that a sufficient uh, condition? Okay, so now uh, let me state a few constraints on this form of free fermion uh, Hamiltonian. Again, chi k is the Fourier transform of a Majorana field, and the first, because chi k is the Fourier transform of a Majorana field, you can show that this uh, matrix function h k must uh, satisfy h transpose at minus k mi must be minus h k. And moreover, the hermeticity of the 
Hamiltonian require HK dagger equal to HK. So if this is the case, then HK can be written as linear combination of matrix of uh, symmetric, real symmetric matrices. And here, uh, this is the imaginary anti-symmetric matrices. The coefficient function in front of the symmetric matrix must be art in K. And the coefficient function in front of the uh, imaginary anti-symmetric matrix must be even in K. So this is just the simple constraint from uh, hermeticity and uh, the Majorana nature of the field. The second thing is that you require H to be periodic, namely HK is equal to HK plus G. And for any local uh, hopping uh, uh, Hamiltonian, you want HK to be a smooth function. The third is that then you have to implement all the uh, symmetry constraint. So usually the symmetry we are dealing with can consist of a unitary symmetry which leave K uh, invariant, and uh, the matrix representing those uh, uh, unitary symmetry in the uh, Majorana space, they must uh, both commute with the symmetric and anti-symmetric part of the matrix. And then we can have uh, anti-unitary symmetry, such as time reversal. It will send K to minus K, but then the matrix representing the anti-unitary symmetry must anti-commute with both the symmetric and anti-symmetric matrices, okay? Lastly, is that this HK here must uh, approach uh, this uh, nodal form uh, I, I talked about before as uh, K, K uh, goes to zero, where this uh, gammas obey the Clifford algebra, okay? So those are the constraints. Any lattice Hamiltonian uh, must uh, uh, obey. Now, so, what is the strategy of the proof? The strategy of the proof is proof by, uh, uh, by a contradiction. So I will assume that there exists a lattice Hamiltonian, which this uh, matrix function HK satisfy all the constraints I uh, talked about before, and then I'm hoping to prove there's a, a contradiction, all right? Now, I unfortunately, uh, it's really difficult in a talk to give all the detail of the proof, so I will just give you the essential idea uh, in the proof. Uh, there are two essential ideas. One is the spectral fl uh, flattening, I will explain to you, and the other is a theorem in uh, differential topology, and that's called the poincare hopf theorem. First, uh, what is the spectral flattening? You give me any HK you claim that you can uh, build, you can regularize it on a lattice. So I can diagonalize the HK. UK, this uh, unitary matrix, consists of the eigenvectors, and uh, this uh, diagonal matrix in the middle, lambda K, uh, are built from the eigenvalues. So what I am doing is that for each point K, I will replace the upper half and the lower half of the eigenvalue by their average. So for example, in this case, I will uh, replace all those uh, top two uh, eigenvalues by the average and the, the bottom two eigenvalue by the average. So I end up with a dispersion which looks like that. The second step of spectral flattening is I will subtract the average of the eigenvalue from uh, each eigenvalue. So in other words, here I will subtract from the uh, uh, upper eigenvalue and uh, the lower uh, eigenvalue, the average of these two eigenvalues. So after that, the uh, dispersion look like that. So uh, note that this uh, spectral flattening I performed, it didn't change the eigenvector. All the operation I did was on the eigenvalues. And, uh, and also a very interesting observation to be made is that after the spectral flattening, the square of the uh, flattened Hamiltonian is proportional to identity. It's just this, this uh, uh, proportion, uh, proportionality constant depend on the uh, momentum k, which measure the gap between the upper and the, the lower band. So this is what happened after the spectral flattening, and uh, therefore, obviously, you can see after that procedure, 
the uh, Hamiltonian but become uh, considerably uh, simpler. Uh, now, I have no time to uh, really show that, but uh, it takes us a uh, several months to prove a very, uh, two very important facts. That is, this uh, spectral flattening preserves the smoothness of uh, HK, as long as I restrict myself to a gap the region in the Brillouin zone. Okay. The second thing is this uh, spectral flattening does not jeopardize any of the constraints I told you before, for, for, for example, the Majorana constraint, the, uh, the symmetry constraint, uh, and the periodicity constraint and so on. It doesn't change them. Okay, now, so after the spectral flattening, okay, the Hamiltonian uh, consists of two parts. One is a symmetric matrix function. The other is the anti-symmetric uh, matrix function. The fact that the square of this uh, flattened Hamiltonian has to be proportional to identity immediately implies this two a uh, matrix function has to come uh, anti-commute with all k. And second is that the square of those two matrix functions has to sum to proportional to identity for any k. Okay, so those are very strong uh, uh, constraints. So for example, the symmetric part of the function will be equal to some uh, uh, arc coefficient function times a gamma uh, times the uh, gamma matrix plus the rest, because we, we know there is a condition that as the momentum go to zero, uh, that is the limiting form of the Hamiltonian. Therefore, that coefficient function must go to ki as, as k goes to zero, okay? Good. Next is the poincare hoff So what poincare hoff theorem says is the following. Consider you have a d-dimensional torus. And on the d-dimensional torus, you have a vector function which has d components. So you have a d component vector function defined on a d-dimensional torus. The statement say that, the theorem say that if this function vanishes at, at a discrete set of point, then there is a strong uh, constraint on the, uh, what uh, this uh, mapping can be. In other words, it says that the, uh, the mapping degree of this function around each of the zeros has to sum to zero. So what is uh, a mapping degree? Uh, the very, uh, so, so, so uh, suppose this is, a, uh, this is a zero. So around the zero, I draw a little circle in this case, or in 3D, I draw a little, uh, you know, little uh, sphere around the zero. Then uh, the function f must not vanish on the boundary of that little circle or little sphere, and then I can normalize the function by dividing its uh, modulus, and then the mapping degree in three dimensions is just the Pontryagin index. Uh, so in 2D, it is the 1D number, and in 1D, it's just <coughs> the image of the right point minus the image of the left point. So it says that around each of the zeros of this uh, vector function, I construct those uh, mapping, and uh, I can compute those, uh, uh, those uh, uh, mapping uh, index. The theorem says that the sum of those mapping index got to be zero. So here, because we already know uh, the uh, coefficient in front of the, uh, the uh, uh, gamma matrix um, must uh, vanish uh, as k go to zero, it might, must behave like ki, therefore, uh, this uh, coefficient function in front of all the gammas must form a degree one map at k equal to zero. Okay, so then by a uh, poincare hoff the sum of the degree of those uh, d uh, coefficient function must sum to zero. Okay, then uh, so in, in, in general, those uh, coefficient function can have zero in the interior of the Brillouin zone or at the time reversal uh, uh, invariant point. But it turns out that because of the Majorana uh, constraint, if there's a zero at k, there got to be a zero at minus k. And moreover, they have exactly the same uh, mapping degree. So therefore, if you sum over the mapping degree of zeros in the interior of the Brillouin zone, it got to be an even number. But the guy in the middle has a mapping degree equal to one. 
That means it has to therefore be canceled by the mapping degree at other time reversal uh, invariant point. And those, uh, the mapping degree at other time reversal invariant point, at least the one of those time reversal invariant point must have a odd, a odd uh, mapping degree. Otherwise, uh, it's impossible to cancel one. Okay, so, yeah. So it turns out that those are the, those things uh, putting together will uh, give you a, a contradiction. The simplest case to exemplify this uh, contradiction is the following. Suppose, uh, so, so now we are focusing on a time reversal uh, invariant point K naught. So, so we are saying due to the mapping degree of this uh, D coefficient function being equal to one near the origin, there exists at least uh, another time reversal invariant point, let's say it is K naught, where this D coefficient function uh, exhibit a odd uh, mapping degree, okay? So let's focus on that uh, time reversal point. So then uh, those are D functions, okay? Uh, if, if, if the, uh, if the uh, momenta deviate from the time uh, reversal point K naught, uh, it says that, uh, uh, you know, uh, right, so, so, the, so the D function must, uh, so this uh, D coefficient function in front of the gamma matrix must exhibit a odd uh, mapping degree. But there are many other uh, coefficient function because the available matrices in building the total Hamiltonian is not only the gamma matrix, there are other uh, symmetric matrix. So suppose in the case that as K goes, uh, as, as the uh, departure from the time reversal invariant point go to zero, suppose all those functions vanish faster than the coefficient function in, in front of the gamma, then the proof become very simple. Because then what happened, I said previously, because the flattened Hamiltonian must square to uh, proportional to identity, therefore the symmetric matrix part and the anti-symmetric matrix part must anti-commute at all k. In particular, it will anti-commute as at all q, as q go to zero. So now you know that uh, this, uh, uh, under, the condi uh, un under this condition, this uh, symmetric matrix is dominated by the gamma matrix part because the coefficient function in front of the gamma matrix part vanish the slowest. Then you, all you need to do is just look at the leading order in the small q. You were immediately able to prove for yourself that the, the value of the anti-symmetric matrix at this time reversal invariant point must anti-commute with all the gammas, okay? Now, this coefficient function, this uh, uh, anti-symmetric matrix at the other time uh, reversal invariant point has to be non-zero because if, if A at K zero is equal to zero, the entire Hamiltonian vanishes because all the, uh, uh, the symmetric uh, matrix part has to vanish because their coefficient function are odd in Q. Okay, so A K zero is not equal to zero. So if this is the case, you can immediately build up a nodal a Hamiltonian, so here is the nodal part, and this AK0 exactly play the role of the mass term. This is completely contradict the uh, statement of uh, symmetry protection. In this case, there wouldn't be any symmetry protection because there exists a mass term to gap things out. Oh, yeah, I, I all right, okay, good. So in any case, the rest of the proof is very you know, technical, and uh, I'm not going to be able to uh, explain to them in detail, I'm glad the time is up. So let me just <laughs> let me just uh, flip over, and there are many you know open problems. Okay, thank you. Uh, question. Gang Hai, can I uh, maybe make sure I understand uh, just to rephrase the the content? Could I think of it this way that when you have a boundary, you can get around this Hoff uh, theorem be effectively because the momentum perpendicular to the boundary is not a good quantum number and you don't get contributions from 
you know, what would be time reversal invariant momenta in that direction to cancel out the degree? Right, well, the poincare hopf theorem literally must uh, apply to a closed manifold. So, so this, uh, you have to have a closed d-dimensional torus. Hi, um, I'm, I, I'm, I want to confirm my understanding. I guess even if after you flatten the band, uh, and h square is proportional to identity, that still doesn't guarantee that uh, h is a, a linear superposition of the gamma matrices, right? No. No. And so you no. need a further no 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 you that. need to uh, you know so 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 by from symmetry okay it tell you what are the possible basis matrix you can use to build up your Hamiltonian the gamma matrix just is just part of it okay there's many many other you know matrices and uh, those matrices are multiplied by either a odd function of k or by a even function of k. But those odd and even function of k must be a sm you know, smooth function of k if this Hamiltonian reflect a local hopping. Okay, so yeah, so so indeed the uh, flattened the flattened Hamiltonian does not restrict the matrix appearing to be gamma matrix. No, but yeah, but you know, the the gamma matrix part automatically satisfies the flattening <laughs> condition. That's the reason after flattening. As k goes to zero, the Hamiltonian still behave as the same as before. Just again, making sure I understand. So you, the symmetry you're using to protect this is are these on-site symmetries, but That's you are right. also assuming that you have a crystal. You're assuming translation symmetry right, right. because K has to be right, a good right, quantum right, number. Right, right. And is there any uh, generalization of this to systems that are not translation? I, I would love to have that, but we are very, very far away from, uh, from, from proving that. So, so, so uh, for Nielsen Ninomia, like, uh, uh, they, they they prove it kind of in a homotopy way, so so is there any way of like yeah, uh, this, this possible like this yeah. uh, homotopy way mm -hmm. of proving it is basically equivalent to the Poincaré Hall. Uh huh. Yeah. So 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 you you can in principle formalize like in a s similar way. Yeah, but 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 in the Nielsen uh, Ninomia, that's a very very simple special case. I I in I general, see. you cannot. I see. Yeah. I see. I see. Great. Yeah, uh, so maybe I missed it, but you said uh, you're only proving it for the minimum size right, Hamiltonian. Right, right. So is that helping you to determine what the target space is when you do Poincaré half? Or uh, wh where does it come in? Right, so, so Poincaré half doesn't depend on the size of the matrices. But it turns out that to prove all the details, we need to know exactly what are the allowed symmetric matrices? What are the allowed anti-symmetric matrices? That's the reason we need to restrict ourselves to the minimum condition. Otherwise, the <laughs> available matrices will be infinite. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think we can take a break. Actually, we still come back at 11. Yeah, let's, let's still come back at 11.